Jesus. Let's go ahead and give the Lord a praise. We celebrate Resurrection Sunday today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I am so glad to see all of y'all's beautiful faces in this place today. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Those of you who are tuning in live via Facebook feed, we encourage you to share this, this encouraging word right now. And praise the Lord. God just ministered to me. And thank you for that song. I love it. I love it. Um, of all the days that we celebrate Resurrection Sunday, you know, very difficult yesterday um, for many of us. But I will also say that this was a difficult week for Christ and his disciples because during these few days is the days that um, he was betrayed and they were about to have a life-altering event. And many of us have already had that this week. Maybe if you haven't had it this week, you've had it before for sure. Yes. But today on Easter Sunday, I just want to encourage you. Let me encourage you with this. This is the day that we're celebrating the resurrection. He got up so that we could get up, right? Yes. And because of that, the resurrection of Christ is the centerpiece of the gospel. It is our hope as Christians. Why? Because we know when someone takes their last breath here on this side, that they wake up in the arms of Christ. And not only that, it's not finished. Can anybody say it's not finished? See, he finished, he finished it on the cross. So we now can walk into a different level, a different hope. Amen. Everybody say amen about that. Amen. So that means when someone leaves this earth and they step behind the veil, I just want to say this, and I'm going to share it tomorrow as well at um, the funeral or homegoing, I'll say it that way, the homegoing celebration of Renee Rollins. You know, I thought about how many times she has gone through things, cancer, heart attacks and and things for so many years and then to know that this weekend this Easter weekend that she was taken home to be with God and it's so beautiful Seth had shared something with me and I want to share this and then I'm going to get right into my message because things can happen in the blink of an eye your whole world can be turned right upside down amen we have experienced that and if you haven't believe me you will if you're here on this side, you will definitely experience that. But I will tell you, some of the things that we take for, for granted is the beautiful, ordinary things, right? Yes. Beautifully ordinary things. And Seth had told us when we had um, left, and I'll tell more of this tomorrow, but he had told me that when he was holding Renee's hand at her bedside, that he had this, uh, you know, he was weeping, he was grieving, he was sad over the loss and already the void, the vacancy that was there because she touched so many of us, just like Jackie, just like Anthony, and so many others. And I just want to tell you something so beautiful because it's important to me that everybody here and all of you watching know if you've lost someone, let me tell you what Seth had seen. And y'all know Seth has died twice, so he has stepped behind the veil already, so he's already shared what heaven looks like and what he experienced. But this is so beautiful. I had to share it with each of you so you don't miss this. He said that as he held her hand, a great sense of peace came over him. Where did that peace come from? Because immediately he seen her. And he said that she was holding the hand of Jesus Christ. And they were walking and that Jesus turned to her and said, well done. Well done. And don't we all want to see that and hear that? Amen. We want to experience it and we will. Can I get an amen in this house today? Amen. So, you know, yes, we're going to grieve on this side because we miss her. But, but... She's not grieving. And Seth said this. He said, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. Renee got to meet Jesus today. Can you even say that? Face to face. Face to face. Give the Lord a praise that we have the hope. Amen. Amen. He got up so you could get up. Amen. Amen. The disciples are about to learn, just like we have, that things can change like that so quickly. Only a few hours before Jesus was arrested, the disciples sat around a table with him, sharing a meal. They probably thought it was just another meal. It was Passover. 
But here they are sharing a meal with him. They've shared many, completely unaware that within 24 hours, their Messiah would be crucified. Their whole world, as they knew it, would be turned completely upside down. And it's the early evening, and Jesus is with his closest friends, his dearest friends, the 12 disciples. And as they're about to share the Passover meal, something he does at the very beginning of this, it's also the first communion that was shared. And we are going to celebrate communion at the end of this service. But before they do this, we find something very important and very telling that Jesus did. He washed their feet. He washed their feet. This is the lowest form of servanthood. It is the lowest form of humility. Here he is washing the feet of the one he knows is about to betray him. See, many of you have been betrayed and you can focus on that. But I want you to know that sometimes it takes that to push you into a new season, a new level. Right? That doesn't mean it feels good. It doesn't mean it takes the pain away or makes it any less. It still hurts. And I'm sure Christ was hurting inside knowing that he is washing the feet of someone he loves so dearly and calls friend. And they're totally oblivious. The other disciples are there. And when Jesus Christ even says something to them about someone here that is eating with me at this table right now is going to betray me, here they are arguing, well, is it me? Is it me? I would think they knew who it was, right? right. You would know if it's you or it's not. Right. But one of the other things that was interesting to me is that they begin to talk about where they were going to sit. Where was their big elevated place in the kingdom? That's what they were talking about. They were so focused on themselves that they didn't even grasp the lesson he was teaching them. And that was ministry is birthed in the spirit of humility and servanthood, but most of all in self-sacrifice. And if this does not describe Renee Rollins... This is not about her, but honey, I have to include her in this. If it's not description of her, I don't know what it is. So they have no idea, the 11 disciples, no idea that the one they love, their beloved Messiah, you know, they had their, their mindset that things were going to go a certain way, right? Yes. And here they are now, unaware that he's about to be betrayed by one of them yes. and crucified in mere hours and buried in a tomb in mere hours. And as they share their first communion with him, and they're not understanding even the symbolism yet of it, Jesus breaks the bread, and as he tells them, this is symbolic of my body that's about to be broken for you. And interestingly enough, he takes the first piece of bread, and he puts it into the sop, or we say soup, they say sop, and he takes that piece of broken bread and he presents it first to Judas. Right. That's right. He presents it first to Judas. Think about that. He knows he is betraying him. Right. He knows he is plotting in his mind, even right then, to go and turn him in to the authorities for money, mere money, right? And yet he did this. And this is an act that's historically symbolic of you presenting the first piece to your dearest friend. Right, right. Think about that. His dearest friend. He's still treating him like he is his friend. And Christ dips the bread into it, hands it to Judas, and all accounts, by all accounts, the worst kind of enemy is those that sit at a table with you, right? right. And those that are talking or, or doing things behind your back, you don't even know about it. And still, even if you know about it, how many of us could say honestly that we could do what Christ did and still call that person friend, right. still right. embrace that person, right. still trust that person, right. serve that person, right. right? So unlike the Pharisees, that they made it well known that they hated him, they despised him, they wanted to see him over and done with, right. quieted, right? right. He walked so closely with Christ, he knew every intimate detail that he even used because he knew that he would be praying, praying that night in the garden. And that is where 
they found him. And only a few hours later, past this dinner, as Judas goes out to go betray him, he leads this mob and the soldiers to Christ. And he says, you're going to know him because I'm going to kiss him. And it is greeting with a kiss on the cheek, you know, each cheek. And so he walks up to Judas in Matthew 26, 49. And I'll have y'all stand at the next reading. But I want to reference this. Judas quickly stepped up to Jesus and said, Shalom, peace, Rabbi. And then he kissed him on both cheeks. And then they apprehended him. Let me tell you what Christ said at that moment to him. Now he knows he's in the process of being betrayed. And here he is, Christ still calls him friend. In Matthew 26, 50, he says, My beloved friend, my beloved friend, is this why you have come? And here he is arrested now. It's been three days. They're grieving, they're mourning, because by all accounts, it looks totally over. It looks completely over. This is not what they imagined. This is not the kingdom reign that they had imagined. And so these three days pass, and we see that some of the women, Mary Magdalene was among them, that go to the tomb to anoint the body with the spices. And they find the tomb empty. Everybody say, yes, yes, yes. Amen, amen. Now, everybody stand up. Let's get into it. Luke 24 and 1. But very early... On Sunday morning, they took the ointment to the tomb and found that the huge stone covering the entrance had been rolled aside. So they went in, but the Lord Jesus' body was gone. Everybody say, he got up. They stood there puzzled, trying to think what could have happened to their Lord. Suddenly, two men appeared Before them, clothed, pay attention, in shining robes, so bright their eyes were dazzled, their eyes were blind. It was some bling going on right there, amen? The women were terrified and bowed low before them, and the men asked, here it is, why, why are you looking in a tomb for someone who was alive? Why are you looking in a tomb for someone who was alive? Verse 6, he isn't here. He has come back to life again. You may be seated. Father, I pray that this word goes to their heart. It ministers to the deepest, deepest part of them. And God, that they grasp the truth of your word. And revelation speaks to him through the spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This is part two of the series I started last week. And it's the conclusion. Get up and get out. Tell your neighbor, say it's time to get up and get out. See, they came to the tomb and they were expecting, expecting a dead body. But when they found an empty tomb, they said this. I want to read verse 5 and 6 again. This is what they found, not expecting it. Why are you looking in a tomb for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He has come back to life again. Many of you are like these women. You've been hanging around a tomb. Grieving over what was lost. And maybe you've lost something or someone that's so valuable to you. Perhaps you're grieving over a marriage that ended or a relationship that has died. Or maybe you've lost your hope and with it your dreams have died. Or you're still grieving over a loss and you are stuck and you literally just don't know how to move on. Years have passed and you still don't know how to move on. I don't know what caused the sadness that you're dealing with today. Those of you who are watching, those of you who are here today, the grief, the despair that's in your life, or what has brought you down to the lowest place, like even depression. But I do know this. You may be like these ladies who have tried to go back to your normal, right? Your normal, your beautiful ordinary, the normal way of feeling, the normal way of thinking, your normal routine, um, but you're stuck. You're stuck in grief. You're stuck. And you keep finding yourself standing at a tomb day in and day out, grieving and mourning what you lost, trying to figure out a way to get it back. I'm not standing up here in a shining robe. I do have some sparkly, but anyway. But as the angel of this church, I will say to you, you are not going to find life hanging around a tomb. Amen? Amen? Not with regret, 
not with anything like that. It's time to move forward. It's time to get up and get out. Amen? I know you didn't expect to lose that job, that relationship, that spouse, that child. You didn't expect to be going through this, yet here you are. You're going through it. You're still looking for something that's long gone. Maybe even trying to find a replacement. Come on. When it was never of God in the first place. Stop looking for living things among the dead. I want you to tell your neighbor that. Where you're going is dead. Where you've been looking is dead. Stop looking for living things among the dead. Tell your neighbor right now. Yes. Because you can't expect something that is dead to be able to give you life. Y'all better hashtag and tweet that one out right there. I said you cannot expect something that is dead to be able to give you life. A man cannot fill that void. A woman cannot fill that void. There is no degree, no career, no car, no house, no clothes, no money that can fill that void or fulfill you and make you feel truly alive. You won't find it on social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. You can't find it in the club, at the party. can't find it at the end of a bottle or the end of a needle. You cannot find it in a bed. You've been looking for life in all the wrong places. Only he can feel the void. Only he can feel that void. You won't find him in any of the places I named. You ask me, okay, Pastor Kimber, where is he? He is risen. He is alive. He is risen. He is alive. Amen? He did what Muhammad couldn't do. He did what Buddha couldn't do. He did what any other God that is false God could do. He got up. He defeated death, hell, and the grace so you could too. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I love the first thing they said to the women. He said, why are you weeping? He said, why are you weeping? I'm okay. Look at me. I'm okay. But see, we still grieve over what we thought it was going to be. The way we thought it was going to be. We still grieve over it. Why are you crying? Why are you grieving? It's okay. It's all going to be okay. Amen? Because he's alive and well. Can anybody in this place, and those of you watching, can you testify today? Can you testify that he is alive and well? Can you testify that he has already come through in impossible situations? Amen? Luke 24, 6 through 7 says this. Have you forgotten? This is what the angels are saying to them. Have you forgotten? And I want to ask you that. Have you forgotten what he said to you? While he was still in Galilee, the destiny of the Son of Man is to be handed over to sinful men, to be nailed to a cross, and on the third day to rise again. He told them. He told them. So why are you surprised? How many of you in this place have forgotten? Because you're so focused on what didn't go the way you thought it would go. You're so focused. You use it as a constant excuse not to move forward. You're still standing at a tomb of yesterday or yesteryear. You're still standing there and letting life go by you. The way to honor anyone is through legacy. Even Christ, you honor him with your life. You honor the sacrifice he gave, the life he lived through your life. The same thing is true of what you're doing right now. If you're grieving someone you lost, honor them with your life. Let that be the legacy that says, I honor them because I continue living here on this side because they are now on that side. Amen? Amen. So I don't know your journey, but I know the fact that you're still here is proof of purpose. Can everybody say it? Turn to your neighbor and say it's proof of purpose. Amen. Verse 8 says this, All at once they remembered. All at once, they remembered. I want to remind you today of what he's already done in your life. That's my assignment. To remind you, no matter what you're facing, no matter what you've gone through, no matter how impossible it seems, I want you to remember the Red Seas he's parted in your life. I want you to remember where he brought you from, where he healed you, where you came from, where he delivered you, where he made a way out of no way. I want to tell you one more time, he got up so you could get up. He got up so you could get up. 
He overcame so you could overcome. Amen? That is what we celebrate today. We celebrate that we can get out of any dead situation. We can overcome any impossible situation. It doesn't matter who walked off from you, who left you, who left you standing grieving where you thought you'd never stand. Let me help you move on today. The same resurrection power that got him up, that same resurrection power that got him up is inside of you. That, that is the good news. Because it's not just about being victorious over there. It's about being victorious right here. What does that mean? If you have fallen, you can get back up. If you have failed, you can get back up. If you have messed up a thousand million times, grace is empowering you to get yourself back up. Amen? He wants you to find the courage to live again. He wants you to overcome because you are an overcomer. He doesn't want you to live ordinary. He wants you to live extraordinary. Extraordinary. So many of you that are in this place right now, maybe you've had one of those weeks. Maybe you've had one of those weeks where you thought this would never happen. And you're still reeling over how it happened, where it took you. And I know when things happen unexpected and it, catches us off guard or catches us by surprise. You know, we can kind of shake and lose our balance a little bit, right? Not just mentally and emotionally, but even spiritually. It can cause you to question. It can cause you to say, why is this happening? Why did that happen? Why did they suffer like that? Why did they suffer like that? Baby, they ain't suffering no more. We have hope because he got up. I said, you have hope because he got up. He got up. Your vision, your focus should not be so stuck here on this side that you cannot see past that you were here to do something because you were going somewhere later. Amen? And I don't know about you, but I do want to hear well done. I do. I want to hear well done. Yes. And you notice he didn't say well done because you did perfect. He didn't say well done because you did it exactly to the T like I told you. He said well done, my good and faithful servant, because I gave you a little bit of something and you took it and you did something right. Maybe you didn't do anything right with it the first time, but now you're getting it back on track. And if you ain't getting it back on track yet, baby, get back up and get out there and do it again. Amen? Don't quit. Tell somebody, don't give up. Don't give up. There's still breath in your body. There's still power inside of you because he lives inside of you. And because he lives, we can face tomorrow. We can face a trial. We can face a battle. We can face anything, anything and everything because he lives. Because he lives. And because of that, we have the hope that comes after that. Amen. Amen. I want to close with this. I want to, um, for those of you, we are doing communion today. Those of you who are joining us, I know this was short, but I am wanting to spend time in ministry today, and I'm wanting to spend time with our communion. So those of you who are joining us, we invite you back next Sunday. We love you. Happy Easter. Celebrate this day as a new beginning because he got up and so you can get up. Amen. And the church said amen. Everybody give the Lord a praise in this house today.